Walking in first course, I got a blueberry board, two roasted beet salads, and a brown dodge. Second course, I got a mushroom risotto, grouper, medium rare hanger steak. I need that souffle for table 24. Hey, what's up, everybody? Thanks so much for stopping by, and welcome to 86 Straight Dialogue with Restaurant Leaders, where we're talking with chefs, restaurateurs, and consultants about everything related to restaurant culture. I am your host. My name is Adam Stafford. I've been in the restaurant industry for about 15 years. By no means does that make me an expert, just someone that really enjoys talking shop and providing value wherever I can. I look to provide you, the listener, with insight and strategy that you can use in your day-to-day -day moving forward. I encourage you to check us out on iTunes, Spotify, our YouTube channel, 86 Attrition, as well as our affiliate website, hospitality1to1.com. I look forward to hearing from each and every one of you, and if you like what you hear, I encourage you to subscribe to the show. Again, thanks for stopping by. so much for joining us again this week on 86th Straight Dialogue with Restaurant Leaders. As always, I'm your host, Adam Stafford. Today, I'm super excited to be joined by Chef Jensen Cummings. Um, for anyone that is not familiar with Jensen's work, uh, as best I can tell, there's not a whole lot this guy can't do. Um, he has uh, been a restaurant owner, uh, ran several kitchens, um, certified Cicerone, uh, works as a consultant, podcast host, the list goes on and on and on. I'm sure there's things that I'm leaving out. Um, so uh, yeah, just thrilled to have you on the show today, man. Really, really appreciate it. Um, really excited to have you on. Really excited to chat with you for a little bit. Um, only because uh, you could do a lot better and probably more concise job than I could. Um, would you mind just giving the listeners kind of a quick little background on you? I know your family's been in the restaurant business for like over a century. Um, Long time. Yeah, yeah let's yeah, start yeah. there. I, I like that part of it. You know, restaurants, there's a lot of legacy in it. And so our family, 1900 in Little Falls, Minnesota, opened our first restaurant called La Fond House. Uh, we've only seen pictures of it. Very much looked like a saloon town corner uh, spot, you know, guy with the bowler cap playing the organ piano, that type of vibe to it. Yeah. And uh, then great grandfather and grandfather had bars and restaurants in San Francisco. And my three uncles, my dad's three younger brothers own restaurants between California, Iowa, Florida. And then even my younger brother, he's a, a chef as well, specializing in sushi. He runs two of my uncle's restaurants out in California. So we're in it, man. We're gluttons for punishment, a hundred percent. And uh, and then right after high school, went out to from California to Ames, Iowa. Worked for my uncles out there. I learned the business. Went to culinary school there. Had no idea. I thought I was going for a summer job to like chase college girls, sure. and did plenty of that. And met my wife out there, right? And it was it was just like the energy, the vibe. I mean, like you find your people, and right away, just the the hazing and the intensity and all of it. I was just like in it. I, I loved it. You know, I roomed with three, four, five different uh, guys that I worked with over the years and, uh, and then really started to take it seriously once I graduated culinary school and uh, Betsy and I decided like, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? And I moved to Kansas city and worked for Debbie Golds, who's a James Beard award winner. You know, she's on top chef masters and like that really crystallizes for her for me being on that chef driven path. And uh, when we moved out to Denver, I was like, that was my focus. So I really, you know, the high end kitchens and, uh, and into the restaurant owner path before I kind of said, I want to think about the industry in a different way and kind of took it, you know, in a multitude of ways, but that's kind of the background on the culinary side. Very cool. Um, so I was kind of looking at your bio. Is it safe to assume that your wife was more front of the house oriented? She worked as a server at one of my uncle's restaurants. Yep, okay. that's where we met. And then events is her jam. So we've worked together for a lot of years, especially in the nonprofit sectors. We started a nonprofit coalition called Heroes Against Hunger. And it was chefs focused on like health, wellness, 
food access, uh, early childhood development type things. And so mm. that's where kind of our love of food and her love of, of restaurants and <laughs> her ability to herd chefs, yeah. right? Because that's a difficult bunch. You know, we are uh, megalomaniacs with sharp knives and getting us to do what we're supposed to do for an event, to be on top of our game, to, you know, get our menus in on time. It's a struggle. It's a challenge. So she was able to do that from the event side. Yeah. She's a, she's a force for sure. And she has a great reputation in the, the chef community out here in Denver. Yeah. I found that really interesting when I kind of started putting two together, two and two together, because uh, I actually met my wife, we were working in an independent restaurant down in Asheville, North Carolina together. And uh, she was a AGM out front. And at the time I was a sous chef at this place. And I, I tell people all the time, I'm like, I really can't figure out what, what, what when she said to herself i want to spend more time around this person because to be quite frank i was not very nice to the front of the house you know uh i've learned a lot about how to deflate the ego since then but it was pretty inflamed at that point yeah Um, luckily when we met i was actually bartending okay uh, mostly for one of my (laughs) uncle's restaurants so you know you have a little bit more charisma when you're out front than when you're in the kitchen, you know, yelling at servers for ringing an 86 item. And it's like same team guys, same team. Right. 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 For sure. I hear you. Yeah. Um, Thankfully that was an open kitchen. So I kind of had to watch my behavior a little bit, but. um... Open kitchen, Adam, one of the best things coming out of the chef driven concepts, one of the best things that happened because when we were coming up, guests were just nameless, faceless assholes that, you know, had special requests and sent back food. And the open kitchen created a relationship. It created a dynamic. It also kept us, to your point, at bay a little bit when we flew off the handle because we were on stage. So I I really appreciate the time that I spent in open kitchens because it really changed my perspective. And I think working front of house changed my perspective as well. You know, I think I got better in the kitchen from spending time out front. I absolutely believe that. And I sure. think my ability then to influence and educate and inspire the front of house got better because I understood how to do that from a back of house perspective, the type of excitement that we have for the food products to be able to deliver that message so that the servers, the bartenders, your front of house staff can be empowered to deliver that message to the guests because they're integral. You know, people, people will go to a restaurant that has okay food with great service they won't go back to a restaurant that has good food and crap service and so we have to realize we need front of house maybe more than they need us sometimes because they could just sell drinks and make lots of money too you know oh yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. and to that same end too you know um as you said it makes it a little bit easier to bridge the gap in terms of educating the front of the house but one of the like one of the biggest things I saw when I did spend a little bit more time with the front of the house and did make a point as I kind of moved up the ladder to be in the dining room a little bit more and uh, interacting directly with people. It's like, it's more challenging than you might think to like get a hold of some kick-ass ingredient or, or some kick-ass product and be explaining to the front of the house, like, this is why this is insanely dope. This is why this is really special. Um, but then if you, you know, if you can take a day, a week, a month and spend it out front, then you figure out the verbiage, you figure out the, the uh, patois, you know what I mean? To sell it a little bit more and to help them get excited about it too. It's communication. I think what I've realized and one of the reasons that now we have the best serve brand and are focused on media, it's communication. And what I recognize now being out of the kitchen full time for quite a few years now is that I was always just a communicator. Food and the experience that I had personally around food, around travel, around being inspired by other humans that were passionate about food, it was just my medium of communication. And I think the more that we think about that, it it helps us redefine the way that we approach it because sometimes we just we hold onto it too damn tight. We're squeezing the shit out of it and not allowing it to like flourish because we're trying to control so much. Bourdain talks about this interestingly. He said that food is about control or cooking is about control and dining is about submission, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm paraphrasing there. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, I'm actually like, you know what? I think cooking might be about submission as well. I think it might be about submitting to the fact that we're here to communicate a 
vision that we have, a flavor, an experience, a story that we're trying to tell. And that might empower us and allow us to kind of let go of how tight we're squeezing onto it. And we see that play out a lot when you think of, you know, we have massive labor shortages and things that were kind of pre-COVID. And now uh, I think about that as like, I don't know how much that's a labor issue versus a culture issue. Like, I think we just, we're holding on too tight and forcing this chef-driven concept, the boom of the restaurant industry in the United States and being, I don't know, being a little bit jaded to the fact that we had an opportunity and we were just in our adolescence or maybe our infancy of what the restaurant in America could be to its community. And so we struggled with that a little bit. And I think then there became a generational gap where like, I, wrongly so, I thought getting a plate thrown at your head was a badge of honor. Getting screamed at was a badge of honor. And yeah, maybe it did galvanize us at certain points. Like again, I mentioned the hazing and finding my tribe, yet it wasn't sustainable. Like if I had thought about it differently, I might not have burnt out in the kitchen. I might not have woke up in, the, in my car in the back parking lot of multiple restaurants that I run because we just work hard, play hard, tough guy, tough gal mentality. Like there was a little bit of strength in it, yet it wasn't sustainable. And in the long term, it just isn't, <laughs> it isn't viable. And I think, you know, we're, we're quick to like point fingers. Kids these days aren't as passionate or this or that about the industry. And it's like, that's not true. They're super passionate, and intelligent. They're just calling bullshit on the, some of the stuff that we had as dogmatic practices in the kitchen. Well, and actually, as you say, thinking about playing the long game, because, long game. you know, like one thing I, I look back now and I've been cooking for about 15 years, right? Um, I look back now and I realize that I only started thinking about playing the long game after I had kids. I didn't think about it at all before that. Before that, I was like, hell with it. You know what I mean? Like if it's just 70 hours a week and uh, uh, three or four fifths of liquor and, and uh, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, and, and uh, half dozen fresh burns and that's what the week looks like and that's what it looks like, you know? This is what I signed up for. This is what I want to do. Um, and so you're absolutely right, man. I mean, it's sort of like, <laughs> it's like two completely contradictory ideas going against one another, you know? I think we have to hold that contradiction though. I think a lot of the best stuff is in the middle, yet you have to pull hard in both directions to get there, sure. right? And we see that play out in all kinds of things and politics and everywhere. I, I absolutely believe that sometimes we need the polarization and the contradiction to like push, pull, push, pull, poke, prod, and like find that sweet spot in that groove. And I think if you look at the macro, if you take a step back, if you look at it from, you know, an anthropologist standpoint or a historian, mm -hmm. you're going to look at this moment and say, yeah, when you're in it, it feels like you're just getting chummed up with the minutia. Yeah. Yet it was just finding that balance, creating the actual sustainable ecosystem of what food and beverage, hospitality, and restaurants can be. Yet when you're in it, you're just getting smashed against the rocks. And so that's kind of the way it feels. And it took me getting the perspective of not being on the 70 hour a week grind of, I talk about this sometimes, I went almost seven year span of never taking a single stick day. And again, it was like this badge of honor. And what I thought I was doing was, was being the good guy and saying, oh, sous chef or, you know, my line cook or dishwasher or anybody else, like you take the day off, I will take on that load. Yeah. What I was actually doing is perpetuating the idea that to be the leader, this is the only way that you could do it. And you had to put yourself out there so far that again, you just, you get burnt out and I couldn't handle it in the long term. And so after 15 years in the kitchen, I said, I just, I have to do something different. And for yeah. a moment, I almost walked away from the industry completely. You know, I got really Cicerone, you mentioned, I got really, really in the craft beer side, spent a lot of time done like 50 plus collaboration beers, done talks all over the country been out to Asheville doing some, some beer and food stuff. And, and I said, you know what? I like, I really need this. Like this industry is absolutely for me. I need to bring the level of influence that I think I can bring yet. I need to do it differently. And I still have a ton of bravado and ego having like gotten the accolades, won the awards, had the articles, all of that bullshit, yeah. let it get to my head. I still have that ego and bravado and I have to own that. It's the contradiction again, but now I'm so focused on bringing value to the people that work within the industry. So many of the people that I both empowered 
and took for granted. And I have to hold again, that contradiction of like, how do I bring that value? And so I still have in my head that I, I still want to go to the hall of fame. I'm not going to do it as a player. Maybe I can do it as a coach. Sure. And that's where some of the, the consulting, the media, those elements, I want to bring that value. I just can't do it behind the burners for 70 hours a week anymore. Yeah. 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 Um, it's funny though. I, I don't know if you noticed this when you walked away because, uh, it actually sounds like we've got somewhat similar paths. I don't know if I've, I've seen the same, uh, the same heights, but, um, when you do, when I walked away from it, man, um, not entirely, you know, uh, just took a big step back. I, I miss that adrenaline. Like, you miss a drug you know what i mean like there were some withdrawals there it was all mental you know nothing physical but there were some definitely some mental withdrawals there for sure now i gotta flip it what's the number one thing that you miss yeah the the number one thing that i it's funny it's it's again it's those contradictions um the number one thing that i miss is uh the friday night when you're going into service you're you're you know, you're packed to the gills, no room for any more resos, nothing like that. Your food runners just called off, your dishwashers just called off. Um, and the shit is just hitting the fan. And somehow you pull it off. You know what I mean? Somehow you, I, I'm not going to say you steer the ship because I don't like that analogy. If anything, the best you could do is just like, keep it afloat and sort of keep it going in the same direction. I'm not going to pretend that you have that much control over it, but um, yeah, you pull it off. Nobody quits. You have, you have a good solid night of sales. Um, and uh, that's it, man. I, I miss that really badly, but at the same time, I know what kind of cost comes along with many nights like that at this point. I know that costs well. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, for me, it's very similar. It's being on that expo line. Yeah, It's like being able to, to kind of lead the team. And I had some interesting stuff that I did in, in the kitchen and the way that I organized tickets and the way that I thought always about how many pickups each station has and was like able to hold about, about 30 orders in my head at one time. Sure. And there was an interesting thing that I tried to do. And I mentioned the plate at your head or the, the badge of honor of getting yelled at. I tried to shift a few of those things. Like I've definitely got on people, absolutely no doubt, mm -hmm. and was super intense. Yet I also tried to work on fast, fast, slow. Sometimes we're just going so fast all the time in the kitchen. And there was a, a deaf cook that I worked with, a, with Ace Lynn Spidell. Ace Lynn Spidell. And he taught me about communication where I made eye contact because he could read lips. Yeah. And we did a lot of physical things where I started doing this with all the cooks. When, when I called in an order and all day, I would touch them on the shoulder and it just slowed them down enough or like made eye contact and said, listen, here's what I got. Or like lowered my voice and be like, I need four, two, one, one, two, right? Yeah. Chicken, this, this, that, the, the other. And got into these like rhythms and you could just see them go, their shoulders drop a little bit. I miss that. Yeah. I miss that the most for sure. It's those little micro interactions that lead to a lot. And what's funny is in the moment, people make fun of me all the time. I have all these quips and sayings and my company is called fortune cookie concepts because mm -hmm. everything is like a fortune cookie philosophy. And in the moment I make it that you can make fun of me. They're stupid. They're yeah. goofy. Yeah. Yet I can't tell you how many people have reached out years later and go, now I own my own place. Now I run my own kitchen. Now I'm the GM here. And I say the same shit you used to say. I was yeah. like, I love that. I love that you, you came to it. Maybe in the moment it didn't make sense to you. You didn't understand it. You thought it was annoying. You thought I was over the top, whatever. And you're probably right. You get the fact that they reach out to me later and say, I get it now. Now I do that. Now I appreciate and understand the difference with that type of communication. Once again, it's just, it's all the communication. No, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's funny how like, as a young chef, at least, you know, really, I can only speak for myself and partly to the people that I've worked with too, but I feel like the communication part, just the easiest pitfall to fall into as a young up and coming chef is believing that there's only, only one way to do it. And it's at a certain decibel and it's with a certain look on your face and with a certain uh, comportment and a, a certain amount of attention to it. Um, 
yeah, it's really, it's really easy to fall into that pitfall. And then that quickly spills out into your social life, which, you know, that takes its own ugly direction too. Um, yeah, well, uh, so, you know, um, sorry, I kind of lost my train of thought there for a second. I know we're going down memory lane. It's hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally went down that. Let's get back on track, Adam. <laughs> right. <laughs> I totally went down that rabbit hole. Um, as far as the stuff I've watched of yours so far, one of the things that I love most that you touch on is, um, you know, I'll sort of use my own verbiage to describe it, but I think we're talking about the same thing. Is um, basically like living intentionally when you're working in the restaurant industry, right? And really taking some time to uh, just think every day and remind yourself every day about why it is that you work so so damn hard and deal with all the challenges that you do. Um, how old do you think you were when you began to understand this? And part of the reason I ask is because, uh, you know, I would tend to think coming up in the family that you did that it might come to you earlier, uh, but maybe I'm off on that. No, no I still don't get it. <laughs> I'm 37 years old. I still don't get it, Adam. Yeah. It's, it's, it's forever. Like you are always, when they talk about being a doctor and your practice, right? Because you never, you never cross the goal line. You've never like accomplished it, whatever it is. And I think it's the same thing. I, I think about it in that way a lot. And so when I started the media brand, when I started Best Served, it was because I was taking some moments of reflection and doing some crazy stuff. Like I got on a meditation app and maybe this is an age thing and having two young sons. And it's like, dude, you gotta slow down and chill out a little bit. And people that know me, I tell them I'm on a meditation app. They're like, you're messing with me. You never. And I'm like, I just gotta slow down and take some, take some breaths every once in a while. And I was thinking about that and just reflecting on kind of the path to this point and kind of where I wanted to take it and what my intention was. and I was thinking about all those little micro interactions, all the people, the communications that I had. And it was never about the food or the drink. Like I could never remember what we were cooking or what we were eating or what we were drinking, but I remember who was there. Right. And I was so reflecting on that. I was like, this is, that's who I want to speak to. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I did an amazing job and was a great communicator. And those people reaching back out is, is a, you know, manifestation of that. And other times people are like, that guy's an asshole. He's a hack. And I get it. You're probably right. And so I was like, how do I spend all of my time focusing on, on empowering the people on the positive side of that equation and supporting the people on the negative side of that equation? And so, you know, I kind of thought about, and you mentioned it, you know, the why, why we get out of bed in the morning to do what we do. And then it got, it's very like Simon Sinek, if, if you don't know who that is, kind of a, yeah, a philosopher. Yeah. Yeah. And he talks about, you know, finding your why, or you go back even further, like Nietzsche was talking about why. And I was like, yeah, it's got to be that. And so I was really thinking about then again, the what and how that we do in the kitchen is like, what we do and how we do it, the dishes on our menu, they just don't matter. Yeah. Like they don't matter. They better be good. Right. Don't get me wrong. They just don't <laughs> matter as much as why we do what we do, who it is we serve, who's gotten us to this point, who's in the trenches. And so that's really our mantra. That's our mission statement is for us to value and focus on why and who before what and how. Yeah. And I think that that shift is pretty important. And so I said, who do I want to speak to? And there's actually a one individual person. They talk about finding an archetype when you're, when you're doing this. And I was like, yeah, what kind of person? And his name is Sean Lauer. And Sean Lauer is a journeyman, sous chef, chef, line cook, up and down all over the industry, been beat up yet still just loves everything about it. It's glut, you know, I mentioned glutton for punishment. Sean's yeah. absolutely that. Has volunteered for countless charity events that Betsy has put on, right, through some of the work that we've done. Mm -hmm. Just one of those people that, like, you, like, how do I speak to you and let you know that you fucking matter? Right. Like, you matter so much to this industry. And it was like, if I could give back every newspaper article, every blog that I was on, every TV spot that I did, and like give it to you, I would in a second. Yeah. And I say that theoretically, because I can't. And again, yeah. I still have the bravado and ego and love the attention. 100%. Yeah, Yet, about it. I was like, I want to speak to you. Like, who is out there speaking to you, with you, for you? And so we hold space for that on the show. We call them unsung hospitality heroes. Hashtag unsung hospitality heroes, throw it in. Yeah. And 
it's really important for us to recognize that. So at every level of the shows that we do, we're speaking to a lot of industry leaders that have kind of the experience, the savvy, those little bits of knowledge and wisdom that we want to really glean and give that to the people that are on the ascension of the industry. Yet we also spend a lot of time saying, tell me about the people that inspire you. Tell me about somebody that we don't know that we need to know. And I've been introduced to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people doing the show. And it's really important. When we started out, November 18th, 2019, we started the, the podcast. Mm -hmm. It was a straight audio podcast. It was on Anchor and BesserPodcast.com. Yeah. And I was like, let's just start having these conversations. Yeah. And we ended up, up until COVID, had 37 episodes. Every single episode had two guests on it. The main person on the, on the show that you know, has a brand name, people know is doing X, Y, and Z, and that unsung hospitality hero that they nominated. And they just had 10 minutes at the end of an episode just to contextualize the relationship. And what would actually be happening you know, if COVID hadn't happened is we would have stayed on the full audio was the plan. And we would have had episodes with the second voice would become the primary and theirs. They would get the opportunity to shout out somebody else. And we continue to kind of interconnect each other that way. And so that was like a really important function. We're doing that in a lot of different ways where people are still being recognized. We're, we're having, you know, Ming Tsai on the show and Zuri Resendez, a kid from Mexico City that people don't necessarily know that I think is the most inspiring person we've had on our show. Yeah. Right. And so it's an important thing for us to be able to understand media and like clearly Ming Tsai or Farmer Lee Jones or Edward Lee, like they bring massive attention and have amazing stories to tell. Yeah, absolutely. I also then want to hold space for people that have never been invited to be a part of something. And we have plenty of people that have not been. And I think that's an important distinction for us. It's why on March 18th, we started, we did the pivot to the live show, the vlog version of the show. Mm -hmm. And we have been on every single day, seven days a week for five months. We're coming up on 180 something episodes every single day on and every single episode getting introduced to new and new people. Almost all the people that are on our show are recommended by somebody else. Again, a function of like, who's somebody we should talk to? Who's somebody that you admire, that you respect? And then again, they're telling us about their dishwasher or their grandmother or the first chef they ever had. Like those relationships matter. They really do. I got to say, I was going to ask you about uh, the reasoning behind doing two shows a day. Because when we first linked up, I saw that and I was like, wow, that's a lot. That was not the answer I was expecting, too, man. That's, that's. Uh, and you know what else, Adam? Impressively it's th it's altruistic. Yeah, no, no, I'm sure. I'm it's sure. therapy for me. I was like, I'm cooped yeah. up in what we call the podcast room in our upstairs of our house. And I was like, man, I just need to talk to people. <laughs> like, right. I, I recognized how much I needed it as much as they did. And I said, we want to do this show because I want to be real time for people. Yeah. And you know, just communicate, like, what do you need? What's going on with you? And so early on, we did a lot of things focused on stories of like, what are you doing right now? How are you staying safe? Is your restaurant open? How are you guys looking at reopening? Are you doing takeout? We had people on from departments of labor and employment, which was a huge struggle for people to get unemployment because restaurant people aren't used to that. Yeah. You know, we, we've never been yeah, one. We'll we can always get, get another job. Yeah, yeah. We'll kill ourselves before collecting unemployment. Yeah. We had people talking about PPP and, you know, SBA specialists, all these acronyms. I have no idea what they mean. Yet all of a sudden I was a conduit to have those conversations. It's like, that's what people need. And then people started to say, I want to hear more about grandmas again. It's like, all right, let's have these full conversations where for 30 minutes, we're talking to people saying like, you know, what was your first job in the industry? We call it catching the hospitality bug. We definitely are taking you know, coronavirus and turning into positives. And when did you catch the hospitality bug is right. something that we talk about a lot on the show, because I feel like those people love telling the story of their first job as crazy as it was, or as instantly hooked in the industry, or if it was just a summer job, people love talking about that. It really galvanizes all of us. We take a lot of different detours in our industry, but that first job, everybody can relate to that. And I think that's been one of the powers of the show. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, it, you know, you kind of touched on that um, through the response, and I'd love to hear a bit more of your thoughts on it. You know, you talk about the importance of recognizing the unsung heroes, right, and recognizing the people that 
don't get the opportunity to head out in the dining room and interact directly with guests and don't get the fanfare and don't get the write-ups and don't get all that stuff for, for any number of reasons, right? If nothing else, just poor damn timing. Um, so alongside of that, what do you think it is um, that contributes to ridiculously high turnover contributes to abysmal statistics in the way of employee tenure um, contributes to like really just the restaurant industry catching a bad freaking rap as, as the revolving door, right? The, the purgatory, if you will, between like uh, um, adolescence and the real job, right? Adam, the most important thing that can be talked about in our industry right now is what you're asking. You know, some of the numbers, we have a 73% turnover rate. The average restaurant employee tenure is 56 days. I, I, I saw that somewhere. And honestly, I, that, was, that, that sounded a bit high to me. It's unbelievably crazy. And look, here's the thing. We can, again, blame it on kids these days. They just don't stick around this and that. And I think the onus and the responsibility has to be in leadership. Attitude reflects leadership always. There's one word that we use on the show more than any other word, and it's acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. We talk about acknowledgement a lot. We don't spend enough time acknowledging each other. And it's an important function of creating lasting relationships. Again, when I did a good job, I acknowledged people. When I didn't, I took them for granted. And so this is an opportunity both for me to put acknowledgement on a pedestal and atone for all the shit that I put people through in the past. And so it's like, imagine if we spent more time not talking about our dishes, but talking about the people that bring them to the table. We talk about it's not what's on the plate, it's who gets it to the plate that truly matters. So this is the function, the, the byproduct of which is your labor shortage, which again is not a labor issue, it's a culture issue, played out at mass scale. And so acknowledgement is the number one thing. Imagine on both sides of the equation from the restaurant and from the consumer and guest side of this equation. Imagine if we stopped trying to sell the commoditized food that everyone has, fried Brussels sprouts, and then it was buffalo cauliflower, and now it's ramen, and the next thing and the next thing. You're competing for a space that is so marginal, yet the only asset that restaurants actually have is their people. Mm -hmm. Johnny and Susie and Zuri Resendez and Tajai Cook and Aaron Shepard and these people, that's the only asset that you have that somebody else doesn't. If you spent more time deploying them as what differentiates you, what makes you have a competitive advantage, you have a massive opportunity because two things happen. Those people are with you forever. Like they are in because the why and the who is strong. They understand why they do what they do. They understand who they are, who they serve. And I think that's an important function that we don't spend enough time on. Yeah. Guests want that story too. We see human stories are always the thing that matters. Yeah. Yes, they love your XYZ dish, yet they come back for the people. Mm -hmm. That's why they're there. That's why they'll continue to come back. And so having those people and investing in them is the most important thing that you can do. And what happens is we're in this, we're in this strange uh, cyclical and completely, completely self-deprecating cycle where we say, well, people don't stick around long enough, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of money investing in them. I'm not gonna pay them as much because they might leave. I'm not going to invest as much time as training. Like we're the worst training industry that I can imagine. Like it's yeah. just so bad. We just throw people to the wolves yeah. and sink or swim. Like when has that ever been good? Like when has that ever worked? Like you might get through it. You're not necessarily better for it. You just barely survived. And you tell the stories of the, of the scrapes and the cuts that you got yet you didn't really understand like what you were accomplishing. And then you left in a year, you left in three months, you left in 56 days, right? So I think it's important for us to acknowledge each other. It's important for us to recognize that you're investing in your most valuable asset. Direct labor is the number one concern when you're talking about a cut and control mentality. And that's what we're in, Adam. We're always trying to cut and control versus invest and grow. Yeah. And so I'm always like, how do you get into a growth mindset? How do you get into an abundance mindset versus a scarcity and survival mindset that we're so often in? 
How do we stop being transactional in the nature of the way that we treat our people, the mm -hmm. way that we treat our guests? Yeah. And there's a lot that the way that we have built the industry, the model of restaurants doesn't work in the long term. It works in the short term. It works in my labor was correct this week. Yeah. My labor was correct this month. My labor was on point this quarter and my bonus is tied to that. So we manipulate the people in the number and the cut and control versus the long-term viability of the restaurant of that business. And so right. there's a lot to that. And we have something we call the Paragon Pillars that we've been working on behind the scenes mm -hmm. that really focuses on completely new outcomes for the industry, which we can talk about if you want to. Yeah, absolutely. Um... I, I did want to get your uh, opinion on something slightly different though. And it's a little bit more <sighs> operationally oriented. Um, this is something that I've been asking a lot of, of Cleveland chefs in the area where I live. Um, obviously just being here and cooking in this area for six years, these are people that, you know, you get inspired by in one way or another. Um, and so uh, what I wanted to hear from them was their thoughts about the timing of reopening for independent restaurants, their thoughts about if that was truly beneficial, um, considering all the guidelines, considering all the restrictions, and uh, just how they saw that whole thing. To be completely transparent about it too, I, I don't know what the differences are between Ohio and Colorado, which is another reason I wanted to ask your opinion about it. So, Here's, here's what I'd say at the highest level. I think restaurants need to recognize that the future of food and beverage is absolutely bringing your brand into people's homes. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the top things I've been telling people is like, how do you be the best at that is the first thing that I'd focus on because of what's happening with dining rooms. So there's a lot of effort being spent on figuring out what you do in dining rooms. And I think it's important. Yeah. Yet the strength that I've seen from some operations is how dynamic they became when they had to do curbside delivery takeout. And that's what I want them to spend a lot of time. Like if you are really good at that, don't lose that to then pivot back to the dining room at 50% capacity with six foot distancing of tables with the restrictions that you have in place because the struggle and the challenge of that is monumental and it's long-term. You're going to be in that rut for 18 months. And so that's the first place that I focus. There's a lot of intricacies in what's happening within the dining rooms themselves mm -hmm. and what the best practices are. Do not lose track of the ball. And the ball is absolutely to go and delivery and takeout. And it's hard because we are so butts in seats yeah. We are a hundred percent. We have long-term leases that are upside down and the leases have been bad always. Yeah. And now they're being exposed for what they really were right. because we're one of the few industries, Adam, where we're actually in two different businesses. We're in manufacturing and we're in retail sales. Mm -hmm. We were one of the only businesses, breweries, distillers, wineries, some of them do as well. Only business where the downtown court of Cleveland, I bet you got some really nice shoe boutiques there. Some nice little, you know, clothing stores. What you don't have is a shoe factory yeah. in downtown Cleveland. Why? Because nobody would pay the rent to put their shoe factory in downtown Cleveland. It's yeah. way out on the outskirts of town where it's $11 a square foot, not $42 a square foot triple net, right? Yeah. So we do though. And this is, this is the contradiction again. The chef-driven restaurant, it created the relationships, the open kitchen, the caring about where your food came from, caring about the people that prepared the food, right? And we saw that. It also mutated into weird food network competitions and reality TV and stuff. Yeah. Yet that part of it, I really love. What happened, and I'm guilty of this, my kitchens got bigger and bigger and bigger, and we spent more money on it. All of a sudden, the shoe factory was 50% of the real estate. And it's, it's a hard pill to swallow, but you do not make one single dollar of revenue in the kitchen. Not yeah. one. Yeah. Every dollar that you make in a restaurant is in the front of house, mm -hmm. right? And so the kitchens got bigger, bigger, and bigger. It put more and more financial strain. We started to have to cut and control more and more and more. And then all of a sudden we were paying people less money. We were trying to haggle from $12 versus paying them $16 an hour. When I got paid $12 an hour, 
15 years ago. And like, it's still a number where people are like, well, it's like 12 to $15, depending on, depending on what, if you want them to be able to survive and live off more than top ramen and a walk up with seven people living, you know, like it's, it's crazy. I have somehow a, it's, I, it's not to cut you off. Some, but yeah, go. Somehow it's the only thing that inflation doesn't apply to. Like <laughs> the cost of your product goes up. The cost of your rent goes up. The cost mm. of everything goes up, but where does the cost of a good line cook sit? 12 to 15 bucks an hour. You know? Yeah. It I think it's something we have to really reconcile. And so <laughs> when I, when I think about it again, it's like investing in that it's, it's the biggest asset that you have. And we look at it and just, again, it's a short term transactional. Mm -hmm. We don't think about acquisition costs. When you lose a cook, it costs you $6,000 annualized. When you lose a manager, it costs you $13,000 annualized. And then all of a sudden, like we do things where we're like, how much have you paid on Indeed, Craigslist, anywhere else you're doing ads? And people are like, wow, I've spent $3,000 in half of this year. I was like, you could have paid four people $1.12 more an hour. Right. You're paying Craigslist and Indeed and like cutting in your most valuable asset and then they leave and then that costs you another six thousand dollars and then you're in this perpetual cycle that again we created this yeah. kids these days did not create that dynamic we did and now they're calling bullshit on us and then we don't like it and right. you know and look are there are there lazy millennials and gen z yeah are there lazy lazy boomers and gen x yeah it just plays out that way always you need to find your people and we just we you know what Alan Plemons, a chef in Missouri, said this to me and just like, it's been blowing me away. He said, the term bodies is something we use in the kitchen mm. and we use in restaurants. And I was like, you're yeah. right. It's like, you're just a corpse. You're just a set of hands. You don't actually matter. We just need warm bodies to fill space. Right. That is not an investment mentality. You're not investing in it. You don't give a shit about them. You yeah. don't. Yeah. And so we have to really come to terms with that. Yeah. We are being called out that restaurants are no longer a great place to work. Right. We have to figure out what happens next to reinvest because the tough guy, tough gal mentality, the industry that we came up in, we loved it. We found our people. We found our tribe. Yet most of us have burnt out and we don't have what, what my vision is, is I want to see 65 year old line cooks getting ready to retire as an industry standard norm because we invested in them. We invested in the viability of their future. They can put 2.5 kids through college and retire with the proverbial gold watch and the pension because our industry has created that opportunity and we just have not. Yeah. No, absolutely. Do you know any 65 year old line cooks, Adam? Uh, I can't think of one actually i know some people that are pretty far up there that are still grinding you can think of a few bartenders definitely yeah. there's some bartenders servers you can kind of make it to that right. which brings up the conversation of how we're the pay structure yeah. within the tipping model i mean that's a whole nother show adam but yeah, there's yeah a i lot. was gonna say we yeah there's a lot to that right i know i know we gotta get to more today so i don't know that i ever answered your question about opening the dining rooms i just want us to focus on the opportunity that we actually have and again we we romanticize like somebody coming and having an experience with us that we are going to change their lives because they sat with us for 78 minutes. And maybe there's some truth to that. And then we say delivery apps like that. They're gouging us. Yeah. They're gouging you. Absolutely. Cause they have the leverage because right. they're forward thinking and we're a bunch of Luddites in restaurants that don't understand technology or social media. I get it. Well, yes. that's such a, such a huge thing that I'm seeing right now, particularly like, you know, as you know, in independent restaurants, uh, you're not going to welcome technology into your space, right? For one reason or another, you're just like, no, that's not how we do it. Like, I'm just not, that, absolutely not. I was talking with a guy last week that's working on a, 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 like a VR training module for restaurants. And I'm like, you know oh. how much money you save doing that in so many places in recruiting and engaging your staff in the first place before they even walk through the door. They know yep. who, I mean, it's insane. But I can tell you right now, personally, five years ago as a, a, a chef de cuisine, as a, a, not even five years ago, one year ago, as a chef de cuisine of a farm table restaurant, if you suggested that to me, I would not have been very welcoming to it at all. You know? Yeah. You know, e-learning, VR, huge right. opportunity right. to like, look at what's happening. It's already happened. We are just so far behind the curve when it comes to some of those things. And then, you know, honestly, 
we like allowed other industries to infiltrate the restaurant industry need that disruption was needed yet now they have the leverage and they have the attention and, and they have the guests and, and now and we don't like it and money. i get it i don't like it either yet yeah. we're demonizing the people that are using that convenience is king don't get it twisted it's been like that always and it always will be i love the fact that i could get somebody's amazing ramen dish or their grandmother's recipe for pupusas at my house. Yeah. The best thing I could imagine. Because when we're talking about the restrictions within dining rooms, the restrictions within just the cost of real estate as a whole for restaurants, somebody who's willing to bring their, your brand into their home should be celebrated, not demonized because you don't like the way that they're doing it, even though it's mostly the way that they can do it. Because you say, well, why don't they just pick up the phone and call? Bull, how many Amazon packages did you get delivered? Why aren't you working with 14 small vendors versus two large vendors? Because it's easier, the right. end. It's simpler, it's quicker. And so we are doing those things to consolidate our effort and time in restaurants. Now we're saying that you shouldn't do that as the consumer. Of course, you wanna fight the market, go ahead, but you're gonna lose. Yeah. And restaurants need to really, really focus on that. And I think about that too. I've been talking about CPG a lot. Every mm -hmm. single restaurant needs to be in consumer packaged goods. Mm -hmm. Your amazing salsa, your amazing hot sauce, your amazing X, Y, and Z, it needs to be packaged today. Not when you have time, not today. And you need to be putting that additional revenue stream and that brand building awareness out there because now people are looking at your brand in their pantry or their fridge, top of mind all the time. It's there, it's there, it's there. The likelihood of them creating another transaction with you is higher. They bring friends over and they show off that, that item. People go, I love this. What is this? It's the restaurant down the street. I've never even been there. This is amazing. I'm going to go there. Right. That is the dynamic that we need to create. That is focused so heavily on the dining room is keeping us from that. Even though you absolutely, if you have a dining room, need to find a way to survive. You need to find a way to make masks and the awkwardness, not as awkward. It comes down to communication creating clarity and communication and consistency for your internal guests, your staff, and your external guests, absolutely. Yet do not miss out, do not take your eye off the prize, which is figuring out ways to be dynamic in every way a guest could interact with you, not just in the dining room. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, one thing that I continue to kind of come back to, one thing that I, I think we've missed as a whole as an industry is uh, training opportunities in terms of uh, consumer packaged goods. Instead of training ourselves on how to, uh, you know, uh, uh, properly prepare sweet breads or something like that. This is something we could have been doing that really yields, like yields several things in the way of revenue, several things in the way of engagement, instead yeah. of just saying, look, look at this somewhat unique skill that I can do as an individual chef. Um, it's truth. Yeah, indeed. Um, so I know we're on a little bit of a time crunch, so I did want to get this question in before we, uh, before we end for the day. Let's do it. And um, with everybody that I've had on the show so far, uh, I'd like to ask, you know, what, whether you're at home or whether you're in your, you know, commercial kitchen, um, well, what's the one thing, the one ingredient, the one uh, pantry item, the one whatever that you find yourself going back to time and time again and then also uh, the first book that really spoke to you in terms of cooking too. Soy sauce. Okay. Soy sauce is fundamentally the most important thing uh, when it comes to my pantry. The ways in which I use it are in multitudes, the types of soy sauce that I have. I even um, had a food lab. Uh, Jeremy Umansky out there definitely yep. was somebody um, who inspired some of that. We were doing a lot of work and stuff. We're actually and, talking with him later this week. So. Yeah, and you know, messaging with him. And we did some really cutting edge stuff on fermentation. Craft beer, we were using yeast and bacteria from the craft brewing process, yeah. which was totally unique what we could create. Like we can make kimchi taste like pineapple just through fermentation. Really, really out there stuff. Right. And so we did a whole bunch of unique soy sauces. Was super, super into it. And uh and so soy sauce is always that, uh, that ingredient that I'm like, people just don't understand it. Mm -hmm. and don't understand the complexity of it. And the difference between styles of soy sauce is so immense. So I think we think of the ubiquitous like Kikoman soy sauce with the green top on every, every table yeah. type scenario. And there's just like a lot of nuance what you can do with fermentation, with uh, 
you know, Koji and, and molds and stuff. So that definitely, and I got so fired up. I forgot the second part of the question. What's the second part of the question? Yuka. Oh yeah. Sweetheart. Can you, I mean, I'm what's up? Phone. Okay. Can you say hi to Jensen? Can you say hi? Oh yeah, my kids have busted on me many times, man. <laughs> yeah, at this point, it's like the the obligatory part of the show. You know what I mean? I love it. People um, message me all the time. Like, that was my favorite part because it was just hilarious and just kind of like my life right now. Well, and I was kind of angsty about cutting it out at first, and now I just leave it. You know what oh, I mean? Oh, you should like, totally I, leave it. Yeah. Uh, what was the second part of your question? I got so soy sauce on my brain. You're good. Uh, the the first uh book. the first food related book i'm not going to say cookbook but the first yep. food related book that really spoke to you french laundry cookbook changed okay. everything for me i remember seeing that in culinary school so i was already kind of on that path yet i was on that path as like one of the pirates on the pirate ship the band of rebel the island of misfit toys scenario mm -hmm. my love of food and true like passion for food i didn't understand it yet yeah. even though i had been working in kitchens for four four years until i even started culinary school it was that book. And I was like, I didn't even know that any of that stuff was possible. I didn't even know food could look like that. Mm -hmm. And so it really changed my perspective. And, uh, and then on our honeymoon, Betsy and I got to go to the French Laundry and have dinner there. And Chef Keller gave us a tour of the kitchen. He actually got us the table. Like, peep this is like a good way to, to <laughs> end the, a show. So we were going on our honeymoon. We had all this stuff set up through the restaurant connections, a lot of the wine connections that we had at the restaurants. You don't make much money, but you got good connections. And you can, you know, we stayed at the Chateau uh, Jordan Winery and, you know, took their car to Cyrus. They, they drove us to Cyrus for dinner. Yeah. And so we were trying to go to the French Laundry, just couldn't get it worked out. He, Chef Keller was in town for a book signing, the ad hoc cookbook at the Williams Sonoma, like at the mall in Denver. Uh, on his way up to Aspen Food and Wine. She okay. got the book signed and said, we're coming out to the area for a honeymoon. We, you know, and he said, do you come into any of my restaurants? She's like, we're trying to get the French laundry, can't get in. It's like, give me a business card. Two days later, his office called and said, Chef Keller has a table for you. Nice. And so like that level of hospitality yeah. has always stuck with me of just like, he didn't need to do that. Like, yeah. like you know, and so, and then he wasn't even working that night. And it was like another surprise. He lives down the street from the restaurant. When we were finishing our, our meal, they called him and said, come on down. And he gave us a personal tour, was showing us the video screen where Per Se was in the middle of service, yeah. you know, that they have inside their kitchen. And so yeah, yeah. that cookbook and then that whole experience definitely changed uh, my trajectory for sure. I bet, I bet, that's huge, man. Well, uh you know we're nearing the top of the hour um again i really can't thank you enough for coming on talking with me today um we're so excited to get your response you were open to doing so um as far as you know if i happen to have anybody tune in that's not already checking out best served um how do they track it down how do they find out more about chef jensen coming yeah we're most active on uh on facebook our live shows go on there as well as youtube so best served podcast is a good place to go website uh, you can also find some good content there bestservepodcast.com and then at chef jensen cummings you can find me all over hell we're even on tiktok man you can find nice. little rants on tiktok or or me uh you know reviewing uh cooking videos and stuff so just try to be active out there with the community as much as possible we are ridiculously active i mean i think we're putting out like 10 things a day <laughs> it's it's, it's nuts. Yeah, and it's, big it's, shout it's, outs. Sophie Breaker, who runs everything. Corey Nelson on the video. Uh, Nick Porter, who's on a lot of our audio stuff. Andrew Parr, who's working the Paragon Pillars behind the scenes mm -hmm. of just reimagining what restaurants are capable of and writing a lot of articles. Uh, Carlos Rodriguez is going to start running our YouTube page. So all of a sudden, we have these great humans that just started for me trying to fumble through be live and stream yard and figure out how to just talk to people. And we have a whole crew of amazing humans doing good work. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's really inspiring, particularly from someone who's only just barely begun to dip their toe in the, in this pond and uh, try to do so on a shoestring budget too. you know how it goes. So it's really inspiring to see it. I greatly appreciate it, man. All right, Adam, I appreciate you and uh, we'll talk again soon. Sounds Cheers. Great.